466 million years ago, a 100 kilometer wide asteroid rips free from its orbit in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter and starts hurtling towards the inner solar system. At about the same time, Earth is plunged into its coldest ice age in the last 540 million years, and about 86% of species are lost in a major mass extinction. A bolide impact crater in northern New Mexico that might have been up to 13 kilometers wide before weathering took its toll on it records an impact so devastating it shattered the very basement rock of North America. Are these things related? That's what we're going to check out in today's video. In November of 2024, Andrew Tompkins and his co-authors published a controversial new paper in which they argued that Earth, 466 million years ago, had a series of rings around it, like Saturn, Jupiter, and some of the other planets. Now, this interpretation did not just come out of nowhere. In fact, it's based on a well-known phenomenon of a very high number of asteroid and meteorite impacts in the mid ordovician all around the world. They're in Australia, they're in Sweden, they've been reported in Russia and North America. In fact, if you look at a paleogeographic map of the world during the Ordovician, it's really interesting that there's a big belt of these things all around the paleo equator. All right, let's start at the very beginning. Why are we even saying there's this massive amount of meteorites and asteroids pummeling the Earth in the mid Ordovician? That all goes back to 2004 and a paper by Heck and his co authors who found fallout in southern Sweden associated with massive bolide impacts. And they were able to calculate an age of 480 million years, which places it firmly in the mid Ordovician period. Flash forward a few years, and Koro Chanceva and others found yet more asteroid impacts of about the same age. You had my curiosity, but now you have my attention. Nothing gets scientists more worked up than the chance to either disprove somebody else's work or make astonishing new discoveries of their own. So that spurred a renewed effort to find more of these uh, impacts around the world. And sure enough, Kronholm and Schmitz in 2010 reported on a mid Ordovician section in China that contained ejecta or debris that was thrown out by a meteorite impacting the Earth. And just two years later, in 2012, Linskog and co-authors reported another asteroid impact in Russia. And in 2016, Darlington and co-authors went back to an impact that was already well known and had been found in 1987 in Australia. This is the Lawn Hill Crater. It was found in 87, and it was identified on the basis of shatter cones and shock quartz. Now, if you saw the video I posted last week on the Santa Fe impact structure, you know about shatter cones. These things are absolutely stunning. There's no question about what caused these. But this thing was well documented in Australia and it was originally thought to be about 509 to 506 million years old or older based on the presence of limestones in the center of the crater. These limestones were thought to be unmodified. And in other words, they were deposited directly on the crater. And so Lindsay and Brazier in 2006 suggested this is around a 500 and something million year old crater. However, again, scientists are always looking for ways to disprove the other guy or get new data. So Vicki Darlington and her co-authors looked at argon argon dates of the ejecta itself of the melt rock and the argon argon, which is argon 40 to argon 39, gave us the date of 472 million years. So that's a lot closer to the other impacts. I agree. So based on these publications, it does seem like there's a lot of asteroid and meteorite impact happening in the Ordovician. In fact, it's been calculated that they were about a hundred times as common as they are today. Get out! But it doesn't seem like any of them were huge, like the thing that ended the Cretaceous. Very interesting. Now switching gears to talk about climate, in 2019, Schmitz and co-authors argued that there was a direct link between all these meteorite impacts in the Ordovician and the onset of what's known as the Great Late Ordovician Ice House, or glaciation. Another well-known feature of scientists is we love to have multiple names for the same thing. That's probably got something to do with making you feel like you've accomplished something, if you can name it. So the Late Ordovician Glaciation is also known as the Late Ordovician Ice House. It's also known as the Hernantian Glaciation or Hernantian Ice House, the Early Paleozoic Glaciation, the Andean Saharan Glaciation, and a variety of other names. It's all the same thing, though. Very simply put, the idea is that an asteroid or a bunch of asteroids, meteorites collide with the Earth, kick up a bunch of dust, choke out the sun, and create effectively a nuclear winter, just like what happened at the Cretaceous-Paleogene boundary. 
the white dot not even dinosaurs and allowed us mammals to reign supreme more or less okay embrace yourself for this one because the idea is controversial there's a whole lot of mechanisms that have been proposed for glaciation or division including things like volcanism tectonics all sorts of mechanisms aside from asteroid and meteorite impacts so this is a debate that's probably still going to rage on for years to come we just need more data what are you waiting for huh what we do know and most people agree on is that the hernantian glaciation or the late ordovician glaciation was the coldest time in earth's history in the past 540 million years it was even colder than the recent ice age we had in the pleistocene it was downright nasty now let's take a moment and think about this for a second and i'll throw in a caveat because there's always a caveat when we're dealing with deep time and science the Chichilub impact crater, which represents the asteroid that ended the Cretaceous by slamming into the Yucatan Peninsula, left a crater about 200 kilometers in diameter. All right, so the thing we're talking about in Australia is an order of magnitude smaller, maybe 20 kilometers. So if the Chichilub impact crater did not cause a nuclear winter, and you know there's various climate models for the end Cretaceous which suggest it got cooler, but there's no ice caps, there's no major worldwide glaciation like we had in the Ordovician, what are the odds that a single or even a multiple small meteors or asteroids could have caused it in the Ordovician? Well, that's just one of the stumbling blocks to fully embracing the theory that asteroids and meteorites colliding with the Earth created this super freaky ice house. There must have been something more. All right, so this is where the paper by Tompkins and co-authors really starts to make a lot of sense. They're arguing that there wasn't just a bunch of rock debris landing on the planet and cooling things off in the Ordovician. They're actually suggesting there was a bunch of dust that was occupying the inner solar system, remnants of this collision in the asteroid belt. So it wasn't just fragments of rock, there was a lot of dust screening off and blocking the sun to the Earth's surface and presumably other planets. So we're really reducing the amount of sunlight hitting the surface before we even have collisions kicking up even more dust. Add to that some volcanoes on the planet and wow, we've got the ingredients for a genuinely cold ice age. Makes sense when you think about it. So why did Earth supposedly have rings? Where did that come from? Well, the idea is that as a big chunk of the asteroid approached Earth, along with all the interstellar dust, the tremendous gravitational forces of Earth, tidal effects, ripped apart the asteroid, demolished it, and sent it into this orbit around the equator. That matches the data set for the impacts that we actually see on the surface. They're in a very peculiar, non-random band around the equator um, statistically significant, apparently, you expect them to have a lot wider distribution if it was random collisions. So it does seem like they were hitting in a particular area over and over again over millions of years. Probably enough to have had some sort of an impact, no pun intended, on Earth's ecosystems and the climate. And while we're talking about the Cretaceous Paleogene event versus this late Ordovician scenario, it's worth remembering that there was, of course, a mass, mass extinction around the globe at the end of the Cretaceous when the asteroid hit. But is there evidence for such a situation in the Ordovician? Well, the answer is yeah, sort of. Again, we're not entirely sure, but we do know that in late Ordovician, 86% of species were lost. So based on the fossil record, we lost a huge chunk of the organisms. Now, it's the Ordovician. There's no terrestrial vertebrates. There's no birds, reptiles, amphibians, nothing like that. The most advanced vertebrates are fish. We have a ton of invertebrates, though, mostly marine invertebrates. But there's a caveat. This mass extinction seems to have occurred about 445 million years ago, which is about 21 million years after the series of meteorite and asteroid impacts. Unless these things were spread out over several million years, which is certainly possible. Um, how well this correlates with the glaciation is another big question mark. So we're not entirely sure that the Ordovician mass extinctions were directly related to either bolides or glaciation. And in fact, there's arguments being made in the publications that they're related to volcanism and a variety of other terrestrial causes. So we'll file that one under who knows for now. We need more data. That's the favorite scientific refrain. I'm going to appeal to it right now. We need more data. I agree. All right, so how does the Santa Fe impact structure fit in with the Ordovician glaciation, extinction, rings around the Earth, and all this talk of meteorite collisions? This is how science works. You read a couple of things, your brain starts putting things together in unique ways, and you go, ah, maybe I'm onto something. That's exactly what happened when I was reading about various bolide strikes and this paper that Tompkins and co-authors just published in November. 
So a few things struck me as I was reading these papers. Number one was the size of the impact crater in Australia. The Lawn Hill crater is about the same size as the Santa Fe impact structure. And that's by itself not unusual. There's a lot of impact craters within that you know, 10 to 20 kilometer um, wide diameter. Nothing freaky about that. It's a really good sized meteorite or a small asteroid. The other thing that struck me is on the paleogeographic map showing the location of the impacts that Tompkins and co-authors published, they didn't include the Santa Fe structure. And I thought, well, I wonder where it would fall out, no pun intended, uh, on the map if I plotted it. So I went ahead and did just that. Take a look at this. It's actually exactly within that 30 degree band of all the other impact craters. In fact, it's closer to the equator than any of them. So it's the right place. And it's not too huge, it's not too small, it's about the same size as some of these other order vision impact craters. What about the time? That's where we run into a stumbling block. So if you watched the previous video I did on the impact structure, you know the age constraint is not great on that. We know it's younger than about a billion years, and we know it's older than about 320 million years. So it's within that bracket. Now the order vision impacts were happening somewhere between 466 to presumably 445 when the extinctions were happening and maybe even beyond that. So certainly the age range of the Santa Fe impact structure fits what we know about the Ordovician impacts. So we've got the right place, we've got within the possibility of the right age, and it's about the right size to match some of these other ones. Does that mean it's one of these Ordovician killer bolides? That we really don't know, and that's gonna require a lot more science. So this is the first step of forming a hypothesis, you look at some data, you look at some observations, put them together, come up with a hypothesis, which is, I think this thing might be related. The next step in doing basic science is you start testing that hypothesis. Like I mentioned before, scientists are always trying to disprove previous studies. That's how science moves forward. We're not trying to bolster each other, we're actually trying to tear each other down. And we're nasty, vicious critics of each other's work. If you've ever read a scientific uh, paper and the reviews that go into it, wow, you've got to have a thick, thick skin to be a scientist. I mean, I like to argue with people, so I don't mind it so much, but a lot of people can't handle it. You know, anybody that thinks scientists are a bunch of wimps, read some of the reviews. I mean, they are just nasty. It just, yeah. I don't know what makes some of you folks tick out there that are reviewing papers. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. In an effort to disprove this, what you would have to do is go out to the Santa Fe structure, start sampling it, trying to get some age dates off any melt rock you might be able to find. That's going to require field work. It's going to require lab work. You have to try to get some argon-argon dates or, or some other radiometric dates. Um, start looking for ejecta in surrounding areas of that age, right? So it can be an integrated study looking at different states. Look up in Wyoming, Utah, where there are sedimentary rocks of this age to see if you can find any ejecta from this impact or not. At this point, it's just my weird idea that I conjured up reading these papers and thinking back to my trip to the Santa Fe structure. Who knows, in a few years you might be reading something about it that, hey, here's another Ordovician bolide strike, and it just happens to be the Santa Fe structure. Odder things have happened. I hope you've enjoyed taking this little journey to the ancient frozen Earth, uh, the catastrophic violence that comes with asteroids and meteorites smashing into it, talking about weird possibilities of rings and extinctions. It's a really dynamic history this planet's had. And we're only beginning to barely scratch the surface of understanding it. There's a lot more to do, a lot more research to be done, and a lot more rocks to look at. And that's what I'm going to be doing from now on the rest of this year is going out, looking at more rocks, making more videos. I hope you'll come along with me. And as always, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.